All right, today we're going to be taking a look at some of the things that were happening at the very beginning of World War II and just kind of how we get to that point and some of the early ongoings of the conflict. Now, first of all, what we want to do is we want to recap some of the things that were happening at the beginning of the conflict. We have to remember that Europe in this post-World War I world is all in a major economic depression. What they're going to be in, in large part, is cause this whole thing is a global depression. It's going to affect the United States, it's going to affect France, it's going to affect Germany, England, so on and so forth. But as we've said consistently throughout the year, when things are in economic turmoil, it causes people to rethink what their government is doing. If their government is not helping them get a job, if their government is not helping them get food on the table, they start to look for other options. That's eventually going to lead us into the totalitarian rule that we've talked about, being exemplified by guys like Stalin, Mussolini, you have Hitler in Germany, obviously. But when we talk about totalitarian rule, again, just as a reminder, we talk about this. This is a single individual, so it's a dictatorship. But the big thing that all of these totalitarian rules are going to have in common is that they're going to require a complete devotion of the people to the state above the individual. Now, the other way that we've also talked about this concept, totalitarian, is to call it fascism. This is a key guiding point that's going to happen in places like Italy, in Russia, in Germany, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, the guy that we've been looking at significantly is Hitler's um, time in office. We obviously remember that prior to becoming chancellor in 33, he had become a head of the Nazi party in the early 20s through the Beer Hall, Beer Hall push and um, with the right in mind confidence upon his then release, he builds the Nazi party into a fairly significant power in Germany. And that's culminated in 1933 when they win a, a large number of the votes um, in the German Reichstag. Eventually, that gets Hitler his power as chancellor, and following the death of Hindenburg, he becomes dictator in 34. Now, the thing that Hitler has that's going to really set him apart from everyone else in Germany that Hindenburg couldn't do, that the government itself could not do um, in previous years, was that he helped Germany. And the way he helps him is by totally ignoring the Treaty of Versailles. He institutes the draft, he expands the military, he develops the Air Force, he's going to start taking land X, Y, and Z. And he really just has absolutely no regard at all for the Treaty of Versailles. And in large part, he plays off of that to the German people, talking about how they were wronged as a result of the treaty. And he was going to seek to try and make things right again um, in order to restore Germany to its rightful place in Europe. So his plan, what he's going to do is, one, he always talks about this Third Reich. And the Third Reich to him was the redevelopment of the German power and creating it back to being um, the power that it was prior to World War I. And what he had to do in order to do it is he had to rebuild Germany's economy. We've talked significantly about the problems Germany's economy was facing especially when you compare it even to the rest of Europe, it was in horrible shape. They were experiencing hyperinflation to the point where people had to literally carry around wheelbarrows that were full of their weekly paycheck. Things were so bad that they were actually using money to start fires. So he had to figure out ways to rebuild that. He's going to do that largely through public works programs as well as recreating the military. Another big key aspect of Hitler's rise to power is the development of that living or Lebensraum, or as we talked about it, just simply to find living space. But what it all comes down to, and this is going to be critical when he starts taking over everything, is that all ethnic Germans should be under the same rule. When you start looking at the places he took, Austria, the Sudetenland, those are all going to be places that have ethnic Germans in that area. And obviously, Aryan supremacy is something that is huge with Hitler. The belief that the Aryans, the you know ancient Nordic races, are superior to everyone else. Um, and as such, he's going to try and do things to, to really catapult them and take other races um, down slash out, as we're going to see later on, obviously, with what he's going to do with, um, with the Holocaust. Now, <clears throat> obviously, a key factor in this whole war getting started, as we've talked about, is appeasement. And again, as we've talked about, appeasement is simply defined as giving in to a dictator or a person in general in order to prevent conflict with this dictator. You have to remember that everything that is going on, that Hitler is going to do, as we've talked about, the Sudetenland issues, the issues with remilitarizing, the Rhineland, everything, all of those are direct violations of the Treaty of Versailles. But no one in Europe is going to do bad things 
is going to do anything to stop him. Now, the number one reason why is everyone remembers what World War I was like. That was a horrible situation. No one was in a rush to repeat that. So when Hitler starts having a little bit more military strength and people realize that if we're going to call him on this, we need to be prepared to use military uh, strength in order to enforce that. And no one was ready to do that. The other part of this that is a reality is that to an extent, some of the leaders felt bad. They did feel like maybe Germany got hurt a little more than what they should have. And when you start looking at what he's going to do in the Czech, uh, Czech region, when you start looking at what he's going to do in places um, like the Rhineland, a lot of people just kind of look and say, hey, this guy's just playing in his own backyard. It's really not anything that's going to involve us. So let's just stay out of it. Let's not bother ourselves. Now, the height of all of this is the Munich Conference, as we've said. After Hitler has annexed the Sud uh, portion of Czechoslovakia, we talked about that, called the Sudetenland, Hitler said, listen, I'm going to take this area, and if I don't get it, I am, gonna, I am prepared to use military force. So now we start having everyone who's at Munich, you know, England and France, they're really a little bit concerned on, now are we really prepared to risk World War II in order to stop this guy? And after meeting in Munich, everyone really just decides, you know what, it's not worth it. We're going to go ahead and we're going to let have Hitler, we're going to let Hitler have the Sudetenland. Interestingly enough, we don't give the Czechs a say at any of this. We just go ahead and we give them part of their country and not worry about at all what they're going to do. And part of the reason why they're okay with doing this is because Hitler said, I am not going to use military action. To some extent, he says, this is the last thing that I want. You give me this and I'm done. So it's very easy for England and France to say, hey, that's fine. Let's go ahead and do this. And that way we don't have to worry about using any sort of military conflict. It's such a great feeling that Neville Chamberlain, who you see pictured here on the right, comes out and says when he returns um, to the people of England, he says, I have guaranteed, I have secured a peace for our time. So you have to understand that for a lot of people that when you're looking at the situation that was in existence in Europe, you know, not 20 years ago, to say I've guaranteed peace was really a big thing. There's just one problem. Hitler, in doing all this, now remember, Hitler, this isn't something Hitler just started doing. He's been doing this since 33 when he became chancellor. He realizes that at the end of the day, Europe's not going to do anything to me. No one is going to try and stop me. No one's prepared to use military action. I can take whatever I want. No one's going to stop me. So Hitler, Munich, just for Hitler, reaffirms that Europe and England and France and so on are just a bunch of sissies about the whole situation, to be quite honest with you. Now, as the war is coming, you know, it's not necessarily something that's right, ready to happen, but everyone can kind of see, especially Hitler, that at some point someone is going to call me, so I need to be prepared militarily speaking. So he and the Soviets signed a non-aggression pact in 1939. Now, a non-aggression pact is not necessarily a treaty. A non-aggression pact is just a promise that I will not fight you. And so in this case, it is simply a promise between Germany and the Soviet Union that we're not going to attack each other. This is something that both Hitler and Joseph Stalin realizes this pact is a joke. No one is going to keep this. He, Hitler does not trust the Soviets. He thinks that they're a lesser breed of people in many regards. Stalin doesn't trust Hitler in many regards. Hitler, at the end of the day, wanted the land in the Soviet Union. And it doesn't take very long for this thing to just fall apart. And in fact, by 1941, the Germans and the Soviet Union are going to be fighting. But this is something, something Hitler is going to do because in doing this, what it allows Hitler to do is to focus all of his concern now on the West. He can just worry about England and France. And if you recall, thinking back to World War I, the concern Germany has because of their geographical position in Europe is what happens if we have a European war and we have to fight it on two fronts? That's not something we want to be involved in. So that's what the non-aggression pact for Hitler is a plan to do. Now, when the Nazis invade Poland, this is going to be the thing that is going to officially start World War II and it occurs in September of 1939. Now, Hitler had eventually demanded a Polish port of Danzig. And Poland had gotten protection from France and England saying, listen, 
yeah, we're going to take your, we, we've got your back if Hitler pulls anything. Well, when we start seeing Hitler continuing to expand his power, continuing to expand his power, when he invades Poland, this is what officially is going to kickstart. Again, it's important to remember that the invasion of Poland officially kickstarts World War II. So if you're ever talking about examples of appeasement, Poland is not something that um, is going to be an example of appeasement because Poland's invasion is going to officially start this war. This war. Now, so getting into now this whole start of the war. Hitler's army is going to invade Poland and doing what historians have always referred to as a Blitzkrieg fashion. Blitzkrieg literally translates to lightning war. And what that just means and just refers to is the breakneck speed at which Hitler is going to be able to attack those areas. His newly developed air force, the Luftwaffe, is going to be something that none of the other groups are really ready to deal with. His panzer tank divisions are so much more superior to anyone else. Within a week, Germany is right outside of Warsaw, which is the capital of Poland. By the end of the month, Poland had surrendered. So at the end of the day, when you really think about this, the fact that both Hitler, now he does have some help from the Soviets coming in from the east. The Soviets want to kind of carve out their little niche in Poland as well. The fact that you have basically taken over an entire country in a month is nothing short of outstanding when you really think about it from a military sp perspective on how dominant the German uh, army is now going to be. And the German dominance that Hitler has at the very start of all of this is going to continue um, following the winter of 1939. So now we're into the spring of 1940. So by April, the guy's taken Denmark and Norway. By May, he's taken the Netherlands. Then he goes to Belgium. Now his concern is on to France. And he signs an armistice with France in June of 1940. This is less than after two months of fighting started in France. You have to remember, France was supposed to be a military, a legitimate military power. It's not Poland. It's not Denmark. It's not Norway. It's not countries that weren't developed to the extent of the military that some of the other nations in Europe was. France was supposed to be a military legitimacy in Europe. France is going to remain an occupied country until 1944 when you're going to get D-Day and eventually the Allied invasion is going to liberate France. But you have to think now, from June of 1940, he just started all of this in August of 39. He's taken over a significant part of Europe. In fact, guys, you take a look at this. Anything that is in a dark shade here, gray, you know, light gray, you know, black, if you will, that is Germany by 1941-1942. Hitler basically has remained, has had total control all throughout Europe. Now, the only countries you see, especially geographically speaking, when we talk about Europe, is Switzerland. Switzerland has always maintained their ability to stay neutral. Spain is not a concern to him because Spain is ruled by a uh, fascist rule of Franco. He's not necessarily a concern for Hitler at the, at the current time. But you think about this, guys, and, and again, I underscore the situation because... This is kind of where this war is kind of spiraled out to when eventually we're going to get involved in the war. And when you have, you know, sections of France fighting and you're going to have um, the British fighting, this is what we're walking into. Hitler has essentially controlled all of continental Europe, save the Soviet Union. This is what he's at by 1941. Now, there's some serious uh, issues going on that we're going to have in Britain that are eventually going to lead us to Hitler making a mistake, really, and heading towards the Soviet Union, but that's something that we're going to get into later. So this, guys, again, just underscores the ability and the strength that the Nazi powers had over all of Europe at the very start of this war. Okay, that wraps up the lecture for today, and we will pick it back up on Monday. Thank you.